Hello and welcome back to another episode of Ken's Training. Today's training is going to be on water treatment. The water treatment is for chillers and cooling towers. Uh, when we talk about water treatment, when it comes to chillers, there's basically two loops of water in the chiller. There's the chilled water, which is a closed loop, and there's an, uh, the condensing water, which goes to our cooling tower outside, which is an open loop, and they get treated differently. Today we have with us Blair Howie, who is a water treatment um, expert who's been working in the industry for 25 years and with 15 years with West Chemical. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Blair and he's going to go over uh, why we have uh, water treatment in general, the different types of loops that are treated for water treatment, what is the overall process for water treatment, and how do you work safely with the chemicals needed for water treatment. So now I'm going to turn it over to Blair. Thank you, Ken. Um, well, you want to go to the first question? Oh yeah, the first, first question, question. Okay, the first question is going to be why do we have water treatment? What is the whole purpose of the water treatment? The entire purpose of water treatment program and curtailing a water treatment program is to uh, provide efficiency, water conservation, and maintain the equipment. So we're trying to be economical, but also maintain the, the building's assets. Water has plenty of impurities in them for calcium and alkalinity. Everybody sees their shower heads at home or coffee pots and you get scale. Well, that will be really bad if we get that inside the chiller barrel or cake up the fill in the cooling tower. Therefore, we start to lose energy losses and make the system work harder and energy costs. And these impurities can cause a lot of havoc. Also, in a water treatment program, we're also concerned with microbiological activity. What do you have? A warm aqueous environment, so you're going to need to feed some biocides in order to get rid of algae and these types of impurities that will inhibit the, the uh, economical aspects of running a plant correctly. All right, all right, that's a great explanation of the, why we have water treatment in general. So now, now we know why we have it, now let's talk about the different types of loops needed that we treat uh, because there is uh, basically, would you say there's two different types of loops in the industry? Or, or pretty, it... pretty much. There's, okay. there's a multitude of different designs in cooling towers and closed loops, but the water treatment aspect is basically straightforward for both of them. You have an open loop system, which would be your cooling towers, and your condenser water systems for the chiller side of the, for, the, for that part, for the condensing side. And then your evaporative side is basically a closed loop, like your car radiator, where you would put Prestone or some sort of antifreeze in the radiator to protect it. In this case, we're in Southern California at this moment, so uh, we don't use antifreeze like we would in New York or in the, in the northern part of the country. But you still want some type of corrosion inhibitor in there, and in these particular instances, we'll use molybdate or nitrite. We use both at most of headquarters currently. Okay. And that's to prevent corrosion and scale in the closed loop system. There also, that, this product here would be fed based upon the controller for the cooling tower for an open loop system. When we're speaking of open loop systems, you're talking about a cooling tower with evaporation. You're trying to reject the heat out of the building. So that's an ongoing dynamic process versus the closed loop, which is just a tight closed circulating loop. The cooling tower is making up water, dumping water through the bleed valve, evaporating water, so it's a much more dynamic system. And henceforth, you need a conductivity controller in order to monitor the water treatment. All right, so we're going to go through the conductivity controller now and how that works. But basically, if you're new to the industry, the easy way to understand the difference between an open loop and a closed loop a closed loop is exactly as Blair described, something like a car uh, cooling system where you have a radiator is completely isolated to the atmosphere, whereas an open loop is actually opened to the atmosphere. So at the top of the cooling tower, the water comes down and goes through uh, some type of a spray distribution nozzle system in which it can go over the fill and disperse a large surface area to release the heat. and um, because of that you have air go coming across it, air from the outside, that water, the open loop water, is now exposed to the outside elements and in that environment it has the ability to catch much more debris than the closed 
environment, almost like a clean room environment, which we, you can really control things with. But when the open loop, that's why you have uh, much more care is needed in an open loop compared to a closed loop. So that's just an FYI on and how you tell the differences and why the, the open loop requires much more uh, TLC than a closed loop. Good point. And just to bring in touch on what Ken just mentioned too, uh, it's similar to like when your body sweats and the wind blows over you. When that, that, that cools your body, right? That's exactly what's happening in an, an open loop like we were just talking about where it's raining down through the fill and the fan is sucking the air in. It's also sucking in dirt and construction that's going on in the area and, and all these particles are getting sucked into the cooling tower which requires cleaning the cooling tower more frequently on an annual basis. But when that water is raining down through the fill, the fan is bringing that, that air across that and it's releasing latent heat and that's causing evaporation which is cooling that water down we call that a delta T, a split between the temperatures. And that goes back to the chiller barrel, picks up the heat, goes back, rains back down, fans evaporating the water, and on and on and on all day long. And what happens when you evaporate this water, the minerals that I spoke of earlier, your calcium, your alkalinity, your impurities, begin to pile up in the tower. You don't see them, kind of like you pour salt into a boiling water for pasta and it dissolves. We have what we call dissolved solids, people call it dissolved salts, some people call it TDS, total dissolved solids. It's basically nothing more than minerals in the water that will form scale if we don't treat it with some type of inhibitor. And since this process is evaporating water, making up fresh water, and, and going on this, through this process all day long, what's known as conductivity builds up. And conductivity is basically a measurement that we use with testing to see how much mineral composition is in the cooling tower water. The higher that gets, we have to put a limit, a threshold on how much minerals we have in the water. Otherwise, we will supersaturate the system and form scale even if we have an inhibitor in there. So that's where we get to the control systems that are going to monitor the conductivity for us constantly, basically all day long as the plant's running. Is, so, th is three the ratio on TDS? For that's us? an ideal. That's an ideal number to try and reach, but uh, in the drought that we're having currently, it's getting harder and harder to get to those types of numbers. And he's talking about cycles of concentration where basically we're concentrating. We started with this amount of mineral concentration from the city as we filled the system. What's our current city approximately right now? Total hardness is around 100 ppm, 120 ppm on average. So your conductivity around here in, in Irvine starts at about 500 micromoles. We're trying to run a 1500 set point, so that would be three cycles. So basically what we're saying is we're cycling up the concentration of minerals that the city gave us to deal with in the beginning, and cycle that up three times its greater value to 1500 that we program on the controller, and the controller says, hey, once I get it to 1500, uh, we've agreed that we're gonna start dumping the water down the drain because we can't go any higher than that. And, but, but through that process, you've saved hundreds of gallons of water per, a minute, you know, thousands an hour pretty much by running these cycles of concentration. So when I opened up the conversation talking about being an efficient plant and water treatment being a part of that, that is one of the goals is to save water. And that's how we go about it through conductivity and monitoring that. So if we want to take a look at the control systems, I'd be happy to show it to you. Okay. All right, now Blair's going to go into our the conductivity uh, controller on the water treatment here, and here's Blair. Okay, here at Mazda we have two systems, so we have Chiller 1 and Chiller 2. They run independent of one another, so you're going to see dual setups here. But uh, we'll just tackle Tower 1. Let's just say that this was if you just had one operating system. This is basically your conductivity controller. This happens to be a Lakewood model, but there are a plethora of uh, models on the market. So uh, we won't go into detail about how this operates. Just they're all basically the same at this level. You're going to have a sample stream of tower water coming through the system here. We typically like to have a little sample pitcock where we can grab a sample. This would be your conductivity probe that's basically monitoring and giving you a display readout uh, all the time. Currently you'll see that it's flashing red. We're not scaling up the plant right now. <laughs> The tower is offline, and so it's just indicating that, hey, there's no flow to the system. And that's because this flow switch is designed to protect the system 
when we don't have flow, we're not feeding chemical into a stagnant line and just wasting product. So once again, we can try to be efficient. So the, the typical controller will come with a conductivity housing probe, a flow switch, and then your sample strain back. And we're feeding an inhibitor through this chemical pump and a biocide through this chemical pump. And then you have a double walled feed tank for safety. So every plant would want to see this. If your fire marshal comes up here, he wants to see the chemicals are double contained and, and housed properly. And then this is your biocide contain, containment here. And so the controller will feed the inhibitor product based on the programming that you designed it to do. Here we're on a percentage of post bleed. Basically, the system's going to reach its conductivity set point. It's going to begin a blowdown process. And I'll show you the bleed valve for this system if we can pan over here. And so you typically have an ASCO solenoid bleed valve or some type of diaphragm bleed valve that opens when the controller senses that the conductivity has gotten to its, its set point. Water is then dumped down the drain. And uh, as that process of high conductivity water is being released down the drain, the tower float inside the cooling tower drops and fresh city water comes in. It all mixes and blends. It brings the conductivity back under control. And the controller senses that and says, okay, now it's time to shut the bleed valve. The bleed valve will shut it. It'll, it'll disconnect the power to the bleed and stop it from that process. And then the inhibitor gets fed back into the tower because we've lost a little bit of treatment in, in, through that process, and so we'll feed it back into the system at that point. And that's basically the nuts and bolts of this operation. You know, we try and keep the probe clean. We, we, we take care of that, pulling that probe out once in a blue moon and making sure we keep it clean so it's tracking accurately. And then you always want to really do your bench testing with your uh, bench testing uh, equipment so that you can make sure that this controller is reading accurately as well. What does the inhibitor chemical actually do to the water? Why, why that particular chemical as opposed to something else? Okay, what the cooling tower inhibitor is designed to do is tackle all the impurities in the water that we were mentioning previously. So you're going to have a lot of hardness, calcium, alkalinity, um, the dirt, the turbidity in the, in the cooling tower. And the inhibitor is basically a crystal modifier. It prevents these two, uh, calcium and alkalinity, from bonding together to form scale. It, tw it tweaks them and then they can't connect together. And that's done basically with a polymer. We trace the product with a, a molybdenum product so that we can see how much treatment we have in the system. You also have chiller barrel with yellow metal, typically copper tubes. So we have azol in the product, and uh, that protects the yellow metals from corrosion and scale. Okay, great. And then how, so that one gets fed. That's the inhibitor product is going to get fed mm -hmm. every post bleed that we do when the TDS gets up, when the, when the tower is running. That's correct. Now you said that the other pump over there was for a biocide. That's correct. Can you go into why, when we do the biocide treatment and, and how that works? Absolutely. Okay, so... In this particular instance, we're going to use bromine because the cooling tower is running at a cycled up level, so that means the pH is a little elevated. So anytime you get above a pH of 8.0 or so, you want to use a bromine product. But speaking of an oxidizer, this is nothing more than your chlorine, your bleach, your sodium hypochlorite, or your bromines. These are all oxidizers. Bleach, like at home at Clorox, and uh, it's a disinfectant. It really just takes care of microbes. It really does kill them efficiently. 99.9% .9 killing effect. So all the oxidizers, they're just different strengths. So here we're going to be using something. We would either use sodium hypochlorite or we would use bromine for the concentration strength of an industrial cooling tower application. So bromine is the product that we're feeding. The controller has a timer, a, a feed schedule timer throughout the week. And so it's just up to your water treatment professional to program that and we can test that through using dip slides and monitorization to see if, they, if we're taking care of the uh, microbiological growth in the tower. And so you can just increase your programming and feed your, your bromine or your oxidizer according to uh, you know, the results that you get from your testing. Okay, that's, that's perfect. Okay, so we went into um, why we treat for water, different types of loops, the overall water treatment process which you got a gist of with the controller and the different types of chemicals and so forth. 
Now, let's, and we're not getting into, um, we do water treatment testing here every single day. And we're not going to go into the, the process of how to test the water because depending upon uh, where you work, it could be uh, a different chemical which That's could correct. require a different type of testing procedure because every place could be unique. But your water treatment professional will pre provide you with a water treatment book and the process for testing and then how to, uh, what to do when you see low or high readings and so forth. So now that we have all that down, let's talk about how to work with chemicals safely so that we don't get injured or hurt when we have to work with them. So um, I guess the most common thing you do is refill these barrels once they're low, mm -hmm. but also I'm looking at plastic tubing. Those could uh, crack, deteriorate. I could have chemicals spewing out on the floor. You're absolutely correct. Okay, okay. so what, what, how should the, the, the people who interact with this product, what is the proper PPE, which is um, your personal protective equipment necessary in order to work with these chemicals in a safe way so that you can go home at the end of the day? That's correct. Ken mentioned a very good point. The absolute number one way anyone gets hurt, especially building engineers and water treatment professionals pouring chemical, is the chemical pump. It is the number one way people don't realize that it's still plugged in, they get isolated, the tubing cracks, the pump starts pumping, the controller calls for something, they didn't, they didn't take the time, they're busy on the radio or whatever, they stop in the process of working on the chemical pump and something feeds or something goes off and you get dinged in the eye or you raised your face shield because you couldn't see very well. I've seen it all, um, but it is the number one way people get injured. And so I would implore in this safety that you use your face shield, safety goggles, any type of rubber glove that is, is designed for chemical resistance, um, not, not like surgical gloves. I would put on real rubber gloves and uh, protect yourself, preferably uh, shoulder length. You can wear an apron. These products here, uh, the oxidizer is pretty pretty intense, but the inhibitor is not as hazardous. But you certainly wouldn't want to get anything in your eye or in your mouth, and you certainly want to go home at the end of the day and be able to take care of your family. So, some of these products can burn you pretty severely. So, any type of rubber glove, that eye goggles, face shield, aprons, all these PPEs are. are mandatory when messing with chemicals for sure and including working on chemical pumps. Okay great so here at our facility we have our um, SDS formerly known as MSDS sheets located on our water treatment table so this way in case some chemical were to get uh, you were to be exposed to a chemical in a way that you shouldn't be exposed you could uh, review the, the SDS to see you know, whether you should be flushing your eyes out for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, calling the doctor or exactly what you need to do. And if you did need to go to a hospital, we could even bring that, say this is what this person was exposed to. Uh, another thing that we have is we've got a shower here. So if a person got chemical on their body, they could go under a shower and uh, get that off of them. Uh, we also have an eye wash station uh, right here nearby, so this way we could flush, we have a uh, saline solution to flush out the eyes, as well as face shield, apron, gloves, and things of this nature. Right here in the room where we're working with the chemicals, so everything is conveniently located, so this way we're just trying to prevent injuries. Um, that yeah, yeah, and two points I want to make about safety and that protocol about hospitalization or um, MSDS reporting. Um, oftentimes you'll, you'll hear or see that they're hanging here near the chemical station. That is totally not necessary. Quite frankly, it, it's not state law. And um, if you happen to get chemical in your eye, and no, no, you're not going to be reading the MSDS sheet anyway. It needs to be in a right to know station, and everybody has the right to know where that station is. So that's the key with MSDS sheets because you want to be able to get on your radio and hit up your chief engineer or some other subordinate or, or a guy that you're working with or somebody that can get a hold of the MSDS sheet and help you out. So it needs to be in a localized place, the right to know station. That, that's absolutely critical. And then if you, wall-mounted um, 
eye wash stations and stuff are nice. You can get those through you know your local district. But if you can get a real eye wash station with the hood, and maybe we could take a picture of that. It's absolutely critical to have that because the number one way you can get rid of a chemical burn is rinsing thoroughly. Okay, so let so we'll uh, reposition and we'll show you our uh, setup. Okay, so here we've got an actual shower. If you pull this, this lever down here, if you had chemical in your body, you could just completely douse your entire body like a regular shower. And, you know, uh, it's not really, you know, uh, designed to, you know, take a shower with soap and stuff, so the water will go on the floor. But in, a, in, a situa in an emergency situation like that, we don't care about the floor. It's okay. Get that chemical off of your body. Uh, we have a regular, you know, it's almost like a residential laundry sink where you've got water right here and you can just, you know, splash, you know, wipe that off, off, off your face, you know, try to uh, rub your eyes as well. And then over here, we've got uh, bottles of uh, eye uh, saline bottles there so you can just, you know, to, you know break, break the uh, closed cap off and completely douse your eye with a saline uh, product there. And then over here, We've got uh, face shields, some goggles, an apron, and some rubber gloves. Albeit they're not the, the ones that come up here, we should probably get ones that are a little bit longer, but uh, still, you know, some good PPE to work with uh, just in case you're, you know, working with a chemical, uh, something happens, so you just want to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So pretty much that concludes uh, this video about water treatment, why we have it, how to work with it safely. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching.